Canada's federal government has announced a variety of housing affordability measures over the last few weeks in the lead-up to the 2024 budget. These include a renter's bill of rights, some changes to mortgage rules, and a variety of other measures aimed at getting more housing built. So, what are these new changes, and what do they all mean for Canadians? That's right, folks, it's time for another Friday update with your old pal, Millennial Moron. Normally, this is a quick weekly news digest, but I've been away for a few weeks and a lot has happened, so I'm going to go over the plans the government has proposed for making housing more affordable, give you some of my personal opinions on the different elements of those plans, and talk a bit about the plan the opposition has proposed as well. I think this is a really important topic this time because this is the issue that's going to dominate Canadian politics for the next couple of years, and the decisions we make now are going to have implications many years into the future, so it's important we make good policy decisions now, regardless of what government is in power. I'll start off with tenant protections and the renter's bill of rights. A lot of discussion about housing over the past decade is focused on homeowners, but really stable and affordable rental housing forms the bedrock of a functioning housing market, especially for lower income people or younger people who are moving around more. Not having as much access to homeownership is one thing, but in recent years, even people with stable incomes are losing the ability to reliably find a place to rent, which is putting a lot of people in situations where their ability to remain housed is no longer secure. With rents skyrocketing and vacancies near zero, this is probably the most pressing issue right now. The big item in this one that's been getting a lot of attention is the ability to use rent payment history to build your credit score. Basically, this is just a way to help qualify people to borrow money to buy a house later on, which doesn't really do anything for affordability, since you're just pushing more people into the mortgage market, but it does make sense from a fairness point of view. Renting a home is not that different from other credit agreements, you're just borrowing a real asset instead of borrowing money. If you can pay rent on time consistently, that's a good indicator that you're reliable enough to borrow money. It also puts renters on a more even footing with homeowners and investors. So overall, not exactly a solution, but not a bad idea either. The other aspect of this that hasn't really been discussed much is that they're calling on banks, fintechs, and credit bureaus to help renters report their rent payment history. It's not that obvious at a glance, but I suspect what they're doing here is laying some groundwork to make sure that landlords are declaring their rental income. This plan would give renters the ability to disclose their payment history themselves and have it verified by financial institutions, and it also gives renters an incentive to do it in the form of a stronger credit score. This creates a paper trail for rental properties that didn't exist before, so it's easy to imagine that this would eventually be used to flush out landlords who are either not reporting or under-reporting their rental income. This government has a tendency to do these sorts of things incrementally, bit by bit, and I think that's what's happening here. Another obvious example of this was making it mandatory to report the sale of a primary residence to the CRA all the way back in 2016, which allowed them to introduce a flipping tax on primary residences much later in the 2022 budget. They create a data set first, then use it for something more significant later on. That said, I do think this one is going to depend on the exact implementation to make sure that a renter's credit history won't be damaged by a dishonest or incompetent landlord. As an example, I once had a landlord take my payment and apply it to the wrong rental account, then serve me a notice to vacate for non-payment by sliding the paper under my door while I was out of town. That was already a big pain to clear up, and it would have been a lot more annoying if I also had to clear things up with credit bureaus at the same time, but if the verification is done by banks and credit unions instead of landlords, it could be useful for some people. The second item is establishing a 50 million dollar fund for tenant protection that provides funding to legal aid services and advocacy groups that raise awareness of tenants' rights. This one kind of seems like nothing to me, to be honest. $15 million is pocket change at the federal level, and it's basically just going to services that already exist. With an estimated 5 million renter households across the country, this is about 3 bucks of extra support per household. Neat! The next item is cracking down on unfair practices like rent evictions and implementing a national standard lease agreement. There's really not enough details here to actually evaluate these ones. Unfair practices are already mostly illegal, but there's not much in the way of enforcement most of the time, and it's often a lot of extra burden for a tenant to fight a landlord when they're already looking for a new place to live. As for a national standard lease agreement, if it's just a minimum standard for leases, it's probably not going to change that much. On the other hand, if they're trying to make a single national lease agreement that overrides the existing provincial standards, it's likely going to cause a lot of legal challenges between provinces and the federal government over who has jurisdiction to regulate rental agreements. We'll have to wait and see on this one. Finally, they're requiring landlords to disclose previous rental rates on rental properties, supposedly with the goal of helping tenants negotiate a fair rent. This was widely ridiculed on social media as being useless, because tenants basically have no negotiating power when vacancy rates are so low that it's hard to find anything to rent at all, so knowing the previous price doesn't really do them that much good. However, like the credit score changes, this seems to me like they're laying groundwork to enable other measures. Something generally missed in the Anglophone media is that it could have a much more immediate effect in Quebec, where rent control is a little different than the rest of Canada. In Quebec, landlords are required to disclose the lowest rent paid in the last 12 months to new tenants in Section G of the lease agreement, but there's no official rent registry, so it's easy for landlords to put in false information or omit it entirely. Unlike other provinces, rent control in Quebec can be used by new tenants as well if they apply for a new rent determination soon after signing the lease. The rent increase has to be justifiable based on actual demonstrable expenses from the landlord. However, without being able to verify the previous rent, there's effectively no way for a tenant to argue for a rent reduction from the tribunal. A group called Vivant Ville has been operating a database of tenant reported rents in an attempt to help tenants exercise their rights, but without government backing and verification through things like tax returns, it really carries no more weight than whatever number the landlord reports. 
Tenants in Quebec also recently lost the ability to easily do lease transfers when they move, which is where they'd assign their lease to a new tenant, so there would be an established amount of rent and the lease would be continuous, which made it much easier to enforce rent control guidelines. Previously, landlords could only reject a lease transfer if they had serious concerns about the new tenant, but as of February this year, landlords can reject a lease transfer for any reason. Having a registry of previous rents charged for the unit would give new tenants a verifiable basis to argue to the tribunal that the rent they're being charged is unfair, but I'll admit that I'm not that familiar with Quebec's rental laws, so I'm not sure how much of an impact this would have right away. However, it does open the door for stronger rent controls to be implemented once a price history has been established, both in Quebec and the rest of Canada. Moving along to the next topic, we've got a few changes to mortgage rules and incentives for homebuyers. First, they're increasing the limit for the RRSP homebuyers plan from $35,000 to $60,000. This program allows you to withdraw money from your RRSP and use it to purchase a home, then repay it over the next 15 years. Personally, I thought it was a bad idea when they first increased the limit in 2019, and I think this latest big increase is also a bad idea. It's just a reflection of our obsession with housing as an investment to encourage people to take money out of their retirement savings or group pension plan and dump it into a down payment. Giving people access to more money that they still have to repay in the future is just putting more cash on the demand side of the equation and isn't going to make housing any more affordable. It'll just mean that more people have to leverage their retirement savings to get into the market at all. As a side note, something that's rarely talked about with the home buyer's plan is that in the event that the homeowner goes bankrupt, the requirement to repay money into your RRSP isn't discharged with the bankruptcy. So, if you run out of money, end up losing your house and all your other assets, and have to start over from nothing, you'll still be required to find money to repay your RRSP, or the annual repayment amount that you were supposed to pay will be taxed as though it was income, and you'll lose the RRSP contribution room forever. Admittedly, this is kind of an edge case, and probably won't happen to many people, but if interest rates stay elevated and people are really struggling, we could see some new stories about it in the coming years. Next, the maximum amortization period for first-time homebuyers purchasing a new-built home has been increased from 25 to 30 years. Again, this sort of thing doesn't make housing more affordable, it just gives people access to more debt by paying it off more slowly and being charged more interest over time. To me, this seems more like a measure to help builders, because as I mentioned in my Myth of the Labor Shortage video a few months ago, builders are in a bit of a price trap right now, where the cost to build a new home is more than buyers are able to afford. So, my assumption here is that the government is hoping they can support builders by juicing first-time home buyers with more borrowing capacity. They're also limiting it to first-time buyers, which more or less excludes investors from the program, so it's not that bad, but it also probably won't have a huge effect either way. Even most established homeowners can't afford to move into a new-build home right now, so it's going to be even more of a challenge for first-time buyers, even with a little extra borrowing power. They're also adding permanent amortization relief to the mortgage charter guidelines, which would allow homeowners to have a reduced monthly payment and an extended amortization for as long as they needed. This basically seems like a stopgap measure to prevent default, but it also keeps those borrowers trapped in debt pretty much indefinitely. This will help people out with their payments in the short term, but with mortgages getting longer and the cost of living continuing to increase, that doesn't really leave much left for things like retirement savings. But that's a problem that's like a few decades away, so who cares, right? Finally, a pretty important one, they're going to implement income verification through the Canada Revenue Agency for mortgage qualifications. Without getting too deep into the subject, mortgage fraud has been a pretty big issue in Canada for a long time now, especially when home prices were rising rapidly. There was no real system for verifying income, so it was pretty easy to forge documents with inflated income numbers to help people qualify for larger mortgages and bid more on homes. Better income verification would have been a good thing to see maybe 5 or 15 or 20 years ago, but hey, better late than never, I guess. Finally, we'll get into the actual plans around housing affordability for building more and putting tighter regulations on the market. First, they're extending the foreign buyer's ban by two years to 2027. This is another one I don't really care about. It didn't do much when they implemented it, and when there's issues like foreign money laundering going on, it's really not hard for those people to acquire property through a Canadian proxy. I don't really consider this one of the big issues in our market, and the ban is really only going to catch honest buyers anyway. Next is an item listed as cracking down on short-term rentals, but the only action that seems to be included is that they'll no longer allow income tax deductions from income earned on rental properties that aren't compliant with provincial or municipal laws. Apparently, they need new regulations to stop giving people tax deductions on illegal businesses, which kind of makes me wonder what the hell they were doing before, but whatever. Next, we've got an item on confronting the financialization of housing, where they make some vague comments about consulting on how to restrict institutional investors from buying single-family homes. Now, financialization of housing is a much, much larger topic than corporate ownership of single-family housing, but we can get into that in a separate video. For now, we can talk about big companies buying up homes, which I see a lot of commenters talking about, but I think it's a bit of a red herring as far as Canada is concerned. This was a big issue in the US a couple of years ago, but it's estimated to be much smaller in Canada, although admittedly, there's no actual stats measuring it. One of the problems in Canada is that the single-family market is dominated by small-time investors who, as I detailed in my Garbage Math series about amateur landlords, don't really understand how to run a profitable business or calculate how much money they're really making. This makes our market a lot less attractive to big investors because single-family rentals are already a lot more micromanagement, but here in Canada, they're also significantly less profitable than things like apartment buildings. 
There's a handful of people here and there trying to make REITs out of single family housing, but it doesn't seem to be that popular of an option yet, and they're pretty sparse on the details of how their funds are actually performing. It's worth noting that even in the US, where the returns on rental properties are much better than they are in Canada, the strategy backfired badly when interest rates went up because the whole thing was more or less a speculative play that relied on cheap debt. Also, just as an aside, the company that was doing this was called Blackstone, not Black Rock. They've got similar names, but they're totally different companies, even though they're commonly confused on social media. So, moving along to how we actually build more housing. One of the key things in the plan is using the Housing Accelerator Fund to pressure municipalities to do things like loosen zoning regulations and reduce red tape for new construction. Honestly, this isn't my favorite idea because the government is basically using their general ability to tax and spend in order to overstep their jurisdiction and tell municipalities what to do, which is supposed to be the jurisdiction of the provinces. But both the government and the opposition have already committed to this idea, so my suspicion is that it's going to happen no matter what. From what I've seen, a lot of people seem to think that the end justifies the means here, but personally, I'd rather see our different levels of government working together to solve problems instead of bickering over jurisdiction. Another item is keeping nonprofit and co-op homes affordable, where they talk about delivering money to keep operating affordable housing forms such as co-ops. Personally, I think co-op housing is a really important and valuable source of affordable housing, but if all we're trying to do is keep our existing units on life support, we're really not being forward-thinking in our strategy. Co-ops are sort of a middle ground between owning and renting, where residents own a share of the project, but they also pay monthly rent, which tends to be much, much lower than market rent. This works really well for the people who are already living in co-op projects, but as you would expect, the waiting lists to get in are years long. There were a lot of co-ops built through dedicated programs in the 1970s and 80s, but almost nothing is built in the last 30 years due to a lack of government support and regulatory hurdles. Across Canada, there are now about 92,000 units of co-op housing nationwide. In contrast, in Germany, which has about twice our population, there are approximately 2.2 million co-op housing units, or about 12 times as much on a per capita basis. This is a very important form of affordable housing that used to be quite popular in Canada, and if we want to make some movement on housing affordability, we need to incentivize and support the expansion and creation of new co-op housing developments by making them easier and faster to organize and launch, not just throw a bit of money to keep stringing along the ones that were built decades ago. It's better than nothing, but we could be a lot more aggressive with this strategy. Next, we've got leveraging transit to build more homes, which is basically making federal transit funding contingent on rezoning areas near transit and universities and colleges for high-density housing. I like this idea, and I personally don't think it's an overstep in the same way that the Housing Accelerator Fund is. Transit funding happens on a project-by-project -project basis and effectively moves money around between different areas of the country as they need it, which is something that actually makes sense for the federal government to do. In comparison, the Housing Accelerator Fund is basically a new program that takes money from everyone at the same time and then only gives it back to municipalities if they do what the government wants. Finally, a really important one I want to talk about and how it contrasts with the plan being pitched by the Conservatives, using public land for housing. This is basically taking unused or underused federal land and leveraging it to build housing, either through converting existing office buildings or leasing the land at subsidized rates to nonprofits or other entities for the production of affordable housing. Now, in this segment, I'm going to delve slightly into the political side of things, and again, I'll remind you that this is my opinion and that your interpretation may be different, which is fine. But personally, I think that conceptually, this approach of using public land to build housing by leasing it out for development or by redeveloping it ourselves is the right approach. On the other hand, I think that the plan being pitched by Poiliev, which is to sell off federal land and buildings for development, is the wrong approach. In the short term, it may get us a few new homes, and it might make the deficit appear a bit smaller for a few years because we're booking the money from land sales as revenue, but after that, the land is gone forever. I want to be clear, I'm not saying this because I want the Liberals to win and the Conservatives to lose, or to try to get people to change their vote. I'm saying this because realistically, if you believe polls at all, Poiliev and the Conservatives are almost certainly going to form the next federal government sometime in the next year and a half, and whoever is in power, we need to advocate for good policies that help us in the future, not bad policies that cause more problems. Political discussions are getting more partisan than they've ever been before, and it's important to realize that you don't have to hate every idea that's pitched by the party you don't like, or support every idea that's pitched by the party that you do like. It's absolutely reasonable to want to get rid of the Liberals. They're years overdue to be flushed out of office. But that's a starting point to fixing the issue, not an end point. We still need to implement good policies with long-term thinking in mind. The housing crisis we're in right now took a really long time to get into. We could have avoided it by consistently implementing good policies over the last 50 years, but instead we let things get worse and worse until it finally became an immediate crisis that's intolerable for the majority of the population. That means that we're finally going to take action on it, but it also means that a lot of decisions are going to be made quickly over the next few years, and we need to make sure they're good ones, because the decisions we make now could also have echoes that are felt for the next 50 or 100 years. Now, I've advocated for this policy before, but while I was away for the past few weeks, I read a lot about how other countries have been successful in implementing affordable housing, and a universal theme across different countries and different continents is leveraging public land to build housing. 
Land is a critical key resource in addressing the housing crisis and is an extremely valuable public asset that we currently have control over and just aren't putting to use for the public good. If we retain ownership and lease it out for affordable housing, we maintain control and have more options open in the future. But if we sell it, the future is a lot more uncertain. How long do the rules last for? If the buyer doesn't build affordable housing, do they return the land or does it become a matter of damages from breach of contract? Think about what might happen when a future government is facing a budget crisis. Will they allow these companies to buy their way out of the affordable housing requirement and let the land slip away permanently? This isn't just important now, it's important in how we address or hopefully even avoid the next housing crisis. I really do believe that if we sell the land off now, it's going to be looked back on as a crucial mistake in the long term. With that said, I want to reiterate that it's completely reasonable to want the Liberals out of office. I just want you to consider the concept that you can say, I like this idea, but I'd rather see someone else implement it and to handle the other surrounding policies. You can want the Conservatives to get in, but still tell your MPs that you like the idea of using public land for housing, but you'd rather see it done as a leasing agreement instead of a sale. Maybe we can ask the Conservatives to conserve this essential public resource for the future instead of squandering it for a few bucks today. I know people in the comments will be saying that's a bad idea because the Liberals will make it too expensive and not actually get anything done, but that doesn't mean that the idea pitched by the Conservatives is good. We've really got to elevate our own discussions beyond red versus blue and tell the government we want them to implement the best ideas from everywhere and actually cooperate with each other because this is a problem that affects all of us. They can differentiate themselves on implementation instead of having to do totally different concepts. Observably, the implementation of this concept from the Liberals so far has been complete crap. In the past eight years, they've built about 10,000 housing units with this program, with about 1,000 of them being affordable. Their target for this program over the next five years is 30,000 units, with 6,000 being affordable. That's pathetic, especially considering our population grew by well over a million people last year, and our housing deficit is estimated at millions of homes. It's totally fair to want somebody else to implement this idea instead, but I do think that it's a good idea. We really, really need to stop spending all our time arguing about who is worse and have a grown-up discussion about what we're going to do about this. Even this budget announcement is filled with examples of the government trying to demonstrate that they've done a slightly less terrible job than their predecessors by showing average stats over the years they've been in power versus the Harper years. I don't care. You've both done a bad job on housing over the past 15 years. Now we need you to cooperate with each other and start doing a good job because otherwise we're totally screwed. With that said, let's take a look at some of the ideas in the conservative plan for housing. The first is setting a requirement for cities to increase their home construction by 15% per year, compounding annually, in order to continue to receive federal grants, with bonuses for exceeding the target. In a sense, it's a good idea to set actual targets, and I like that they base this on housing completions rather than housing starts, because completions is a harder stat to manipulate. However, I do think they need more work on how the targets are set. First of all, compounding at 15% annually means you're doubling the number of homes built every five years, which is pretty steep. Second, applying the same target to all cities is basically punishing cities that are already doing well and rewarding cities that are doing badly. If you look at a place like, say, Edmonton that's ahead of the curve on things like zoning reform, they've got a lot less room to build 15% more every year. But a city that's been stifling development for decades will have a much easier time hitting that target. Realistically, I think the numbers they've used here are just blowing smoke for the election campaign, but with some overhaul, they could be reasonable and more fairly applied. Like I mentioned earlier, this one is a little bit of an overreach on federal jurisdiction, and interestingly, it kind of puts them at odds with the Conservative government in Alberta, who are currently pushing a bill giving themselves the power to veto funding agreements between the federal government and municipalities. And as much as it's a weird time for Alberta to be fighting this battle, and it seems like an obvious attempt to stall zoning reforms, they kind of have a point. The federal government is trying to sidestep the provinces to influence municipalities, and now Alberta is saying, okay, well, we'll just sidestep you and quash the deal instead. I think that voters really need to push for the different levels of government to collaborate more because really, all of their budgets come from you. People in Alberta are in a situation where their cities are wasting their money on delays because the province is spending their money to stop the federal government from giving their money back to their city after taxing it away from them. This is just me talking, but I'd rather see that money spent on something else, like say, housing. But back to the housing plan, they've also got a bit about making transit funding contingent on upzoning near transit, which is a good idea, but then they add a note about not providing the funding until housing near the stations is built and occupied. This might sound like a common sense approach if you're not familiar with these types of projects, but in effect, this will delay funding until years after the transit project is built, which is more or less equivalent to saying you won't provide any federal transit funding for roughly the next 10 years. The problem is, these projects require cash flow to actually get built in the first place because you need to actually buy materials and pay people to design and build them. So, having the government pledge money that won't be delivered until years after the fact and is contingent on private sector building apartments nearby is kind of useless. This idea could be good. All they need to do is drop the second half and do a better job with specifying the zoning reforms to make sure the area is attractive for housing development. Next, we've got a bit about attaching bonuses and salaries at the CMHC to a target of a 60-day turnaround time for approving new housing projects. I like this idea. 
No notes. Next, there's removing GST on new rentals that rent at below market rates. Good idea, but I think it could be expanded. Like I said near the beginning of the video, rentals are, in a sense, the bedrock of the housing market, and we really don't have enough of them right now. This GST exemption could be extended to all new rental projects, or even combined with the transit-oriented zoning idea. Provide even bigger tax incentives for affordable, high-density housing projects next to transit or post-secondary education. If you can make the business case attractive, it will get built. Finally, we come back to the item on selling off public land. As I said before, I think it's a good idea to use public land, but selling it off is probably a mistake. This one is easy to change, so if you're supporting them in the election and agree that it's a bad idea, consider reaching out to your local candidate about it. Just as an extra note, one thing I haven't seen in either plan is any sort of public housing. It's become something with a real stigma in Canada, mostly because we don't trust our governments to do anything competently, but it might be time to take another look at it. It's a critical source of housing in many other countries, and even though it might not always be the greatest thing in the world, it's probably better than the tent cities that are springing up across Canada. I don't want to tell you what to think about it, but I do encourage you to research the topic with an open mind and in the context of our current problems. I think we're still behaving like we have a housing surplus, when really we have a pretty bad deficit and some more drastic action might be needed. So that's all I've got for this week. Obviously it was a long video and mostly just me expressing my own opinions rather than doing a lot of hard analysis, but I thought it was an important one to get out there this time. But what's more important than my opinion is your opinion. If you've watched this far, I really don't want you to just take my opinion at face value and assume it's right. If there's anything I've been trying to tell people, it's that we need to each individually think about these issues instead of just aligning ourselves with someone we like. I'm not a professional in this field. I'm really not even that smart. I'm just a guy who thinks about this stuff a lot. Go out, listen to other people, read more information for yourself, see what's being done in other cities and other countries, and then come up with your own position that aligns with your own priorities and values. Don't just listen to some politician or some real estate guru or some moron who makes YouTube videos from his mom's basement. Your opinion matters too, so make it a good one. As always, thanks for watching, enjoy your weekend, and if you've been missing my updates or one of the people who was furious about my pre-taped joke update last week, don't worry, I'll be catching up on the various housing and economic news stories in the coming weeks. Also, in case anyone is interested, this is the one year anniversary of me posting my first video. <laughs> it was actually a couple of weeks ago, but I was away, so I'm telling you about it now. See ya!